Hello and welcome to the Can We Ask You This podcast. My name is Corey. I'm Rosalind. Uh, and we are so grateful that you are joining us today. Uh, we have a special guest, Sherry, uh, mm-hmm. and really uh, excited to hear from her as she shares her experience being uh, an international worker with organizations such as Samaritan's Purse and working as a, a social worker during the Rwandan genocide. Yeah, it's a difficult conversation, but I do feel like Sherry did a really great job of not making it too graphic. It's just a heavier episode. So just as you listen, just be ready for that. She never went too into detail about too many things, but just it is heavy and that's probably okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's what this podcast is here for. Mm-hmm. Just to, It is uncomfortable, but it's a conversation that we're grateful that she is willing to have with us. Yeah, and I love she gets to the question, not to give too much away, but she asks the question, is God good? After witnessing some pretty hard things and if you find yourself asking the question is God good and you feel like you've been suffering this episode is for you because we all suffer whether it's you know I mean Sherry's experience of suffering is a lot different than most of our experience but we all suffer with something and how do we come to the conclusion that God is good or do we come to that conclusion so let's jump in yeah Welcome, Sherry. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited about our conversation. I mean, we've already had a little bit to talk uh, before this, but uh, I love that we can just give you uh, an opportunity to share about your journey, because I I think this is a journey that not a Mm -hmm. lot of people have experienced. Mm -hmm. I think when even, there's lots to talk about, but I think even for myself, thinking about the Rwanda genocide, I mean, my experience is the movie Hotel Mm -hmm. Rwanda Hmm. that alone was very very difficult to watch and but I know you have some experience with that as well uh, being right on the ground and I think there's lots to your story I know that we'll get into and so I'm just yeah really grateful for you to be here today to share with us and let us ask you questions about your experience so thank you No, that's great. I really do appreciate the opportunity to share what I saw and, yeah, how that changed me. Yeah. And, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I guess just to help everyone understand who Sherry is, uh, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, maybe where you're from, uh, how you became an international worker, kind of that whole journey? Okay, it it kind of jumps from before and after Rwanda. Uh, So I I grew up in Calgary. We moved here when I was eight, and we were part of First Alliance. So that's kind of how I, in connection here and back on staff. But when I was in college, I went overseas for a year, just in the middle of college, just trying to see maybe what God might do. And it was actually working in a bookshop. So it wasn't wasn't any super exciting. Uh, I had no skills or anything to offer, but I learned a lot about working in a church in another country and working cross-culturally and and came back thinking, yeah, I'm not called into international work and that won't be happening. (laughs) But it had opened my eyes and, and my heart a little bit. And when I graduated from U of C, I went for social work. There weren't a lot of jobs in Alberta at that time. And I was looking at moving north or trying to think, you know, outside the box, what could that look like? And one place I contacted was Samaritan's Purse. And it was just the perfect timing. They weren't necessarily interested in hiring a social worker, but because of the situation in Rwanda, I ended up Mm -hmm. there. And I'll fast forward now because I won't get into that story. But when I finished my time there, one thing that struck me was I really wanted to go somewhere long term. And they go in and they do a lot of great work. A lot of it was short term at that time, like development Mm -hmm. relief, right, in war zones. And thinking, I hate not being able to speak directly to people and not being able to know the language. And so someday, you know, when I have money and I go to seminary, then I'm going to go somewhere long term. And then God just started that next step. And so I ended up going to school and I ended up in Macedonia for 22 years. So that's wow. very short and condensed version of my life. And then God brought me back here this year, which is a huge change from life from the past 30 years. So no kidding. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here, obviously. And the topic, I mean, when you say genocide, like that's, that's such a, a loaded word. Uh, and I think many listeners probably have different experiences, but we're here to hear about you and your experience. Could you share a little bit about kind of boots on the ground? You arrive, what that experience is like for you. Yeah, I arrived 
after the main part of the genocide and while the war was continuing, the civil war. But I was also, you know, I was 24 and just graduated. Hmm. Growing up in Canada, no major trauma in my life at that point. And so I ended up there going into a refugee camp in the country with over about 60,000 people. And the reason was there was over 700 kids at that time overlooked in the food distribution oh, wow. because they weren't connected to any family. So they had no uncles or aunts or parents. That doesn't mean that they're orphans necessarily. We call them unaccompanied minors just okay. because everybody ran, right, during the genocide. Right. And you saw from the movie, and I, I have a hard time watching that movie, by the way. I finally watched it once, and I don't think I'll watch it again. But okay. everybody ran. Hmm. And so, yeah, one of the things we had the pleasure of doing later was, was getting everybody's names and information and, and doing the search to see who still had family. And a lot of them did, but... So I ended up going in, and we had to do things like, okay, food, you know, clothing. So everybody's got the, the set of clothes they had when they arrived. And so, like, for the little two-year-olds, we got beds, but there's no pillows. So we cut off the pillow tops and the sides so that we could just put them on, like, little dresses on all the two-year-olds. So now all of them have a second set of clothes. I mean, things that yeah. you go, well, is that really? I mean, we did whatever we could. It was, like, problem-solving on a daily basis. Wow. But the first day I arrived, we were given a translator And a guy with a gun got in the car with us when we crossed the border to take us there so that we weren't, like, going around anywhere else. It was on a mountaintop, so the refugee camp was below us a little bit, and the army was just above us a little bit. So we were given a spot right there with a medical clinic. Smart's Purse had a medical clinic going. And so I stayed in a tent, and the girl who'd been there for a couple of weeks, she'd grown up in Kenya... She was a nurse, and so she would bring a baby back to the tent every night, trying to nurse them back to health because Mm. they've shown up from all sorts of situations. Somebody found them and brought them along. The big bellies, you know, the malnutrition, and then there was a lot of different diseases running through the camp, dysentery and diphtheria. And so my first night in the country, in the tent, this baby died in the middle of the night. And that's when you go, okay, so this is outside of my realm of experience. Wow. Yeah, just not, you know, and you, mm. you sit there and you pray because you're thinking, okay, you know, but just the baby was looked like a newborn and was probably four months old. Oh, and just man. It was it was heartbreaking. So what did that? Uh, I just can't imagine that's sorry to interrupt you, but that's your first night. I don't know. I imagine you came into it with hopes and expectations of what it would be like. But did that sort of I just imagine that might be a bit of a slap in the face of like what you expected to or just a dose I, of reality you weren't expecting, or maybe you were expecting? What did that do I mean, to your heart? I had been told, right? And you know you're going into a war zone. You know that yeah. people are dying daily still, mm-hmm. right? From physical, you know, they'd been in the war, or whether it's the, the health because they hadn't been eating for the last month because they'd been in hiding mm-hmm. or whatever the reason. I had been warned, and I, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. And you go in, yeah, you want to help. But you know that's just a drop in the bucket, Yeah, You have to have that realistic expectation. But it's still, yeah, disheartening, right? You want to see some wins. You want to see some kids. And there were. There were kids getting better. One of the other things that was really hard was AIDS was quite rampant Hmm. in the country, right, in general. And so you know that even as you're treating people that a lot of these children could easily have AIDS from from their parents from before or because there was a war and there's bloodshed, right? And so... We're not testing for that for everybody, but just as you look at these kids you're investing in, how many of them will actually grow to adulthood and that reality. So we, you know, again, we problem solving. And then the war ended not long after I arrived, which was nice. And then so the capital city opened up. And so we started moving people off of the mountain and we found a spot to move the kids to. We brought them off the mountain and we started recording things. So we started recording stories. Hmm. And of course, I'm doing everything through a translator. So I'm, we're trying to get the story written down so that we can find family members or find, you know, whoever. But we're also trying to record some history, right? And make yeah. sure that we know where these kids have come from. And I, one of the first ones I remember, I've got these two twin five-year-olds, right? These two boys. And so they're both just cuddled up to me. Aww. And the lady who's been like staying in the same home with them is asking them the questions. And my translator is translating. And they're just looking at me with their big eyes as they tell me about watching their parents macheted to death. Oh, my gosh. And I'm holding them, right? So you're Mm. not responding. And almost every time we would hear something really hard, there was this group sympathetic, ah, they kind of had a a way of having a musical response. Even the way they spoke kind of had a musical 
note to it. And they speak mm-hmm. kind of slowly in this sing-song voice. And so they did this, ah, and then kind of together, but God is good. And I just remember that day going, is he really? I mean, and I believe it with my whole heart. Yeah. And I don't think that he promises health, wealth, prosperity. I mean, I would never have said I believe that, but somehow this struck me wrong. And, yeah. and it was a lot of processing then. What does it mean? Like, is it fair that people are suffering and is God still really in control? And how? Because a lot of these people were believers. My translator was actually mm-hmm. a believer and she had lost all her family. Wow. So it didn't seem fair. And we all know life isn't fair. That was at a different level than anything I'd experienced. And so trying yeah. to process that. I imagine that it would be very confronting because, yeah, like you said, you would have never said that you believed in the prosperity gospel kind of thing. But seeing kids who are telling you that their parents have been macheted to death and they, they say God is good. Like, how did you process that? that? How did you work through that? Because that's a whole reality that a lot of us, most of us will never experience, hopefully. You you know, know. I I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And I still was an outsider looking in. So I don't Mm -hmm. even want to speak to like how hard it is to go through something. Right. And then to come to that. But as an outsider, but but living amongst people and loving them and, and wondering why do bad things happen? And is God still good when bad things happen? And so it really got me searching and reading, you know, rereading all those passages in the Bible and and looking at it differently. And I look at things like there was no promises that everything is going to be okay. There's lots of promises that will suffer. Yeah, it just means something different. God is good doesn't mean, and my good isn't necessarily a comfortable, easy life. Mm -hmm. None of that was ever promised. And um, yeah, and yet, and I would have said I never believed that. But when you're confronted with something Mm -hmm. difficult, deep down inside, we all kind of believe that. We all kind of believe God owes us and that if I'm faithful, that there should be blessing. And I just think we misinterpret what the blessing is. Yeah. I was actually talking with our lead pastor about how the Beatitudes, you know, if we really say, you know, blessings or have a blessed day or hashtag blessed, it's like, yikes, no thanks, actually, because a lot of those things are not great. Yeah. You know, blessed are you when you're persecuted or and the the poor the weak. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do we actually think those are blessings? And I mean, it sounds like that's kind of what it came to for you was, is God enough in those things? I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have been there. It feels so good to do anything that has help, right? And so any little thing that improved life or opportunity felt worthwhile. For me personally, the biggest thing I learned was that God is much bigger than the box I had put him in. And do I trust him? Do Honestly, do we trust him if his good doesn't look like what I want it to look like in my life? That's good. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the times we have our own idea of what God is and who he is without actually like getting to know him. So we have these expectations that if I know God then, or if I have an awareness of God, or if I think I'm a good person, then... It's like, yeah, like I don't deserve these things or my life should be good. Yeah. As you learn more about following Jesus, the promise isn't that there is no suffering. It's that he's with you in the suffering. Yeah. And kind of continuing on the journey, war ends. What happens with everyone? Like I, it's really cool to hear how you, the active uh, nature of trying to bring everyone together. First, I would love to hear stories of, families reunited because it's I feel like there's probably lots of stories of families not being reunited Mm -hmm. hearing some of the stories of families being reunited and then where did everyone go like what yeah yeah, what happened then yeah because I stayed about another six months after I stayed through Christmas then and I had gone in the beginning of June so it was interesting so we got them settled into this area just outside of the city. It was an agricultural high school, so it had dormitories, and they weren't going to be starting school anytime soon. So they just gave it to us, and we moved the kids in, and we started a school, and so everybody in the neighborhood came to the school. But because we put the kids all on a list, so family would show up, actually, especially in the first couple of weeks, people might show up to find their child. Some people just randomly showed up because they were going through the different orphanages, but mostly it was people who'd found the list and came. Every once in a while, we'd hear of an uncle or an aunt or even a a parent in one of the villages, and I'd load the kids into the car, and we'd drive out there. On the hope that 
that on the hope, they were well, there? Well, because we'd, we'd have heard from somebody who said they were there. Okay. And so we were like, yeah, let's, uh, let's pack up and go see them. So we, we actually delivered a few kids to their homes. Wow. Usually, again, it was usually an uncle or an aunt, but the, the reunion, you know, just finding someone because mm. the situation had been so awful at the time. Mm-hmm. And so many refugee camps outside of the country, right? So people are still coming back into the country and trying to, to figure out who's where and where they're going to live and what they're going to do. We had kids from both sides, both tribes. That adds a whole different dynamic. What was that like, if you don't mind talking about that a little bit, that dynamic? You know, before the war, they'd all lived together, and there was intermarriages. And then on the radio, they announced, you know, pick up your machetes and kill this wow. side, and, and they did. And so, But there were always people who helped and hid people, and... So the kids seemed fine, Mm -hmm. seemed fine Mm -hmm. with each other until one day we showed up. I had been, whatever, off campus picking up some supplies. We came back and some people from the army who were unhappy with how things were going had shown up and were screaming and the kids separated to different sides of the field and picked up sticks. Wow. And I was like, oh, so now I can truly identify who's on which side. It's so easy to motivate people to fight. And whether it's fear of the people who are yelling at you or whether it's, yeah, uh, it also taught me that that mankind is deep down just sinful. Hmm. (laughs) And we all are, right? Like it could happen. People are like, oh, I'm so glad that could never happen here. People hear fear and hate as well. Yeah. It's actually so much easier for something like that to happen than you think. Yeah. Which is like shocking, right? But it's, it's also so interesting how we think we're good people, yeah. but how easy it is yeah. to act out in anger, respond you know, with fear and, and hatred, and how quick it is for people just to, and to in jump the into moment, that in, in a the moment. moment. Just jumping yeah. into the situation. And yeah, so it's very hard to make the right decision, I feel like, to try to withstand jumping into that war or that conflict. So, and you have to, you, you got to pick a side, Right. Sometimes you just are trying to survive. You were also pretty young. So how did I just think like that would have been very confusing to be a sort of a bystander. You're active, but you're not part of the war. What was that like for you? And how did you how did you know how to behave or where to stand even? Well, I think it's good that being a naive young person, it's not like I could tell the difference between the tribes when I first showed up. Mm-hmm. So I didn't treat kids differently based on which tribe they came from. And that's the Hutus and the Tutsis. And they do look different, but I couldn't tell when I first got there. Yeah. And, Could um, you when you left? Yeah. Yeah. Usually. But I also, there was no good side, right? There mm-hmm. were issues on both sides and the kids are innocent. So mm-hmm. it was easy for us to just invest in the kids. And that was our main job. And it was easy for the medical staff to just invest in people who are sick Mm -hmm. because that's their job. Nobody asked us to pick sides. So Mm -hmm. we we never had to fight that battle. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so our orphanage went, I mean, even by the time we had moved off the mountain, people had started looking for kids or sent word. And so we went from 750 to just over 400 by the time we'd moved off the mountain okay and then it slowly started dwindling down and so we eventually it merged with another group a few months after I left you want to be able to get them into homes and you want Mm -hmm. to be able to not keep them in an institution a couple years later I was working in North America and going to school and I got a letter that had been forwarded it had been written to our group but I got a copy of it from John Bosco. So he was a 14-year-old kid Mm -hmm. who had been a part of, who had been in the orphanage. He was sick all the time. And to be fair, we kind of assumed he had AIDS. We'd never tested him, but he was smart. He, He already spoke English, so he often would help us out just interpreting things. But he, between the kids and us, but he was a leader. I mean, all the kids looked up to him. He's just, and he was a believer. He loved Jesus. And so he just, he had this great spirit about him of helping, but he was in and out of the clinic constantly. Hmm. And, uh, and so he had written a letter to the, the nurse who had worked there with us, just saying, you know, I'm dying, oh, and man. I want you to pray that God would perform a miracle. But if he doesn't, just think how easy and how great life would be, something along the lines of, you know, I'm going to a much better place. Wow. And I'm still praying for a miracle, and I want you to pray with me. But if we don't, then I still meet you again someday in heaven. Wow. And... 
I, uh, that's one of the few times I actually burst into tears. I think you get a little bit numb and it had been a couple years later and hearing that. And again, just being reminded of the, the so unfair Mm -hmm. and at his age, like what happened for him to catch that, right. To get that. And then never having a chance to grow up. And this boy with all this potential of being a leader, just kind of how people, all the people responded to him. Yeah. And never having that chance and thinking, that's not fair. Did he, <clears throat> did you find out if he, he did, he did pass? He had passed yeah. away by the time we got the letter. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really hard. Okay. So you witnessed uh, a lot of really difficult things and yet you saw these kids saying God is good and you saw the good works like taking care of the sick and the fatherless and those things. So what, uh, how did you reconcile the question, is God good? even maybe a couple of years removed once you'd moved away, moved back to America. How, how did you go through that? I think just needing to take time to really process, like, because life isn't fair. Mm-hmm. I think we try to say God is good, you know, when life is fair. Life isn't fair. It wasn't fair what happened. Mm-hmm. What happened wasn't good. In the midst of that, God is still good. And I, I, I started really researching in the Bible to try to figure out who is God really? Because he's obviously not who I thought he was. And I hadn't even realized I had this impression of a much smaller God, but he was, he was obviously not who I thought he was. And so I want to trust God with my life, but now trusting God means I'm opening it up to whatever happens, Mm -hmm. happens because that I have no guarantee that it'll be easy or comfortable. And so just, just looking and looking like, so Joseph, right? He did not have a nice life. But then he ended up Pharaoh. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not the likely scenario for most people. <laughs> so then I looked at the Israelites, right, just following through in Genesis. Mm-hmm. I mean, the 450 years of slavery in Egypt before Moses and, mm-hmm. and God he says he heard them and he saved them. What if you were born in year 250? Right. Oh, yeah. And I don't, they were born a slave. They had a very unfair and difficult life. And then they died a slave. Yeah. Right. And that was a part of God's plan. That was God's people. And I think we sometimes expect just I'm one of God's people or I'm a believer that God will be nicer to me or, mm-hmm. or, and he does bless me. I just think that again, what does it mean that God blesses me? And so some of the promises, like what are the promises he gives? Cause he doesn't promise an easy life and he doesn't promise no pain or no suffering, but he does promise peace. Right. And he does promise wisdom and he promises eternal life. I, there's somewhere I'm going and he gives purpose. Mm-hmm. And do I care more about his plan and what he is trying to do in this world than I do about my own personal comfort? And that's where there's this real trust thing. But I can't believe God is good if I don't actually see that maybe his purpose is bigger than my little life. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a humbleness to that. Like, I'm not that. I mean, I am important in his eyes. He loved me enough to die for me. But I'm, I'm also, I'm not him. Your life is, I guess, listeners, you can't see this, but like I'm holding up my fingers <laughs> a centimeter apart on a huge timeline, right? So it really does put things in per- into perspective when you talk about the Israelites. And how would you, in North American culture, at least, like you said, we pursue comfort. How would you, I don't know, I don't want to say market God to somebody, but I guess what would be the appeal in North American culture? Because we're like, God is good. But your life will not be, probably, if you follow him. And I know what you're saying. Like, I love that I have the presence of God with me at all times. And for me, that makes it worth it. But if you don't know that feeling, how would you tell somebody about how much better that it is to have God with you and have persecution and discomfort? And it was. So I went overseas eventually, right? And you're sharing about Christ with people whose families might disown them if they come to know Mm -hmm. the Lord. And so you're trying to say, why would this be worth it? That seems, in from a worldly perspective, that doesn't make any sense. Right. But, I mean, do you even remember before you were forgiven of your sins? I think that's one of the disadvantages of actually growing up in a Christian home is you don't remember how great it is that I am forgiven. Hmm. My guilt, he takes away your guilt and your shame, Hmm. right? Those are separate promises. And he also offers... You said the peace, like anything that you go through, you have somebody with you that that's this amazing peace. Yeah. But he also offers purpose. Like it does say you will have life to the full. I mean, mm-hmm. I wouldn't trade this life for anything. And it, some of the worst moments are also some of the best moments. So yeah, I think, but if we don't focus on who Christ is and what we've gained, 
and we're just trying to look at it from a worldly perspective, you lose a lot. Right. And, and Christ said that, take up your cross and follow me. When he was talking to people about whether they should follow him, he asked them to count the cost. I think hmm. we try to market it here because you use that word. Yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't market it. He's actually enough, but we should tell the truth. Oh, that's so because good. Because I think young people actually want a challenge. I feel like, right? Do you really want something that's that easy? Like, it, that's why it's not believable, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. You do know. I think I that what you just said is brilliant. It's so true because, yeah, I think market was probably the wrong word. But I... No, I knew what you meant. I didn't think... That's not Rosie. It's, it's not, a culture yeah. of, like, trying to... I don't know. I just feel like we're trying to convince people that of things, and it seems like every other belief or spiritual thing is accepted except Christianity because it's maybe been made to look too nice and too easy. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe there is something about that challenge that people are looking for. Yeah, there's a lot to think about there. I just think sometimes we forget that it's not wrong to challenge people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and there are there's a lot of benefits. And some sometimes God blesses you. Some people are believers and he blesses them amazingly, right? And they're faithful with their funds and so God blesses them with more. Like mm -hmm. it's not that you will definitely have a difficult life, but you will have challenges because every, every life has challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think living in North America, we have fewer than the average person around the world. Mm. And we're not conscious of that. But any challenge you're going through, this woman that I knew in Macedonia, I mean, she had such a difficult life. She used to say, because someone else would have such an easy life compared to her, and she would not mock them, right? Like she wouldn't, because <laughs> they'd be whining, and she would just let them talk. And I'm like, doesn't that bother you? Because their, their life is so easy compared to yours. She goes, the weight you carry is the only one you feel. There's no need mm. to compare them. Oh, it was kind of, yeah, I, she was really wise. And she was like, everybody carries a weight. Yeah. And that's the only one you feel. And so everybody who's listening, we all struggle. Yeah. We all have pain in our lives. And you don't have to compare it to the horrors of the genocide in Rwanda to know that you've suffered. And some people have suffered more. And I don't know why God made that choice. That's one of the questions. I don't know the reason why this person has a more difficult time than someone else. But I actually believe God has a plan. He doesn't allow suffering because he doesn't love you. He loves you, and he allows it anyway. That's hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's suffering. It's hard. And I, I really appreciate uh, you sharing just how we all suffer, and it's all a weight you know, that we carry. Mm -hmm. And what a humble attitude for her to share with you of like, yeah, no, that's, that's still a weight. It might not be like consider you know suffering for me like maybe I've gone through more but we all have weight to carry and kind of suffering to process through no one is without suffering so Sherry if there is anything that you'd want people to hear what would you have to say I don't share the story about my time in Rwanda very often because it's hard for people to hear it not because it's it's not important to me and now kids are studying it in school but when you hear about the things that are hard and the suffering, I want people to ask the question, is God good? I want people to ask the question, mm. like, why? And then I, I want them to actually take the time to process it and investigate and not just ignore pain and suffering or try to pretend it's not there. I feel like we can sometimes do that. Totally. But not to be afraid of it. I think that's actually something I've been really leaning into lately is that God is good and God is big. And so let's ask the questions like he's not afraid of them. But I think sometimes I can only speak to myself, I guess, or even in maybe North American culture, but we're afraid to ask the questions because we're afraid of the response or the uh, or the answer. And I think that's one of the things I love about God is you can try to poke holes. But if we really believe it's true, and I do, if we really believe he is who he says he is, then it should be okay to ask those hard questions, right? So I, th I love what you just said. Go ahead and ask those questions and yeah. see what you find. And then it, I also think that leads to more authentic faith. Yeah. It sounds like that's what it did for you. I mean, it was life-changing for me just to, to recognize who I thought I was serving. Mm -hmm. Just was much bigger than I had limited what he could or couldn't do. And is a little terrifying then, you know, to pray, okay, God, use me any way you want to when you recognize he could really do anything. Yeah. 
but also freeing. He can do anything. He can answer any of my prayer requests, or he can send me through something really awful in my Mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. But he is amazing and able to do anything. And so we, we limit him both ways then. It seems like it was quite a gift then that you... I always think it's like the hard things in life, you wouldn't want them to happen again. But at the same time, maybe you would because you had, you witnessed these awful things, but it changed your faith to more of a real understanding of who God is. Yeah. I would like the situation that happened in Rwanda to never happen again. Mm -hmm. And I know that it happens over and over again around the world. And I've I've seen that in other places as well. So you wish that that would never happen, Mm -hmm. but being able to be a part of that Yeah, that was a gift for me. Hmm. Like the gift of being able to bring help, to bring healing, uh, to be a support. Yeah, being being able to be a support in the midst of that and everything that you learn and the people that you meet. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still stay in touch with any of them? No, there, it wasn't as easy. I'm old. And so <laughs> you're yeah, not old. <laughs> there wasn't, uh, there weren't, nobody had a cell phone and there wasn't email at the time. And so nobody that I knew there of the Rwandans would I have been able to stay in touch with really the people that I worked with there. Yes. I still know some people from Samaritan's oh. Purse. Cool. Yeah. I guess any final thoughts, any more questions? I, I mean, I just, I'm grateful that yeah. you're, for your time here and allowing us to ask, you know, some of these hard questions and thank you for your openness and honesty of your journey Mm -hmm. uh, of processing is God good when seeing something as, as tragic as, as genocide, just being able to witness something like, like that. No, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I think we don't always share everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share. I do have one final question, which may lead to more questions. But we'll, we'll see. see. How it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly final question. How did that impact your time in Macedonia? How did your experience in Rwanda carry forward to your time in Macedonia? Did it influence it at all? I mean, I think it's influenced my life just mm. in general. Um, what you learn, you bring with you. And then my time in Macedonia, I arrived during the Kosovo crisis. So there were refugees from Kosovo in Macedonia when I got there. Wow. And I watched the refugee train come through. That's uh, when they were going up to Germany or to the real Europe. We're not part of the European Union. So about 10,000 people a day were passing our borders. So just having an earlier experience with refugees and, Mm -hmm. and what that looks like, but just in helping people, right? I think knowing my God better and understanding and having more compassion for people was always helpful. And that's probably carried through even now to today. It, it doesn't really matter where yeah. you are. There will yeah. always be people who are hurting, mm-hmm. and God is the same everywhere. I love that. So what would you say to someone who maybe wants to get involved you know, with helping with refugees, maybe international work? What are some practical next steps? I mean, they might not be here in Calgary, but like what, for our listeners, what would you, how would you encourage them? I, mean, I think just take the next step. So like at first you can help with the refugees, like reaching out to people that have been coming in, newcomers. There are ways to sign up to have, you know, internationals who are at schools here in your home to get to know people from a different ethnicity. They mm. probably have a story, I mean, depending on where they're coming from. If you want to go overseas, like first we'll have short-term trips this summer, but there's dozens of organizations too, right? Looking at just Google online and see who is doing what and where mm-hmm. and make steps to to find out how God is leading you and where he's leading you. I love Googling it because it's so relatable. We can all Google (laughs) it. Just Google it. Well, no, it's true though, because if you, sometimes we overcomplicate it. Like, okay, God, where are you going to call me? And he's like, well, what are you going to do about it? You can Google something too. And And go talk to your pastor. Yeah, whichever church. Somebody like they have, I'm sure whichever church you're from, they have an idea of how to help get you involved and what the next steps could be. Yeah. But if you don't, and you're just out there listening, I went to Samaritan's Purse, somebody I knew had worked there, and I called them, and they said, we don't hire social workers, thank you for, you know, <laughs> thanks for sending in your application, and then they called me three days later and said, actually, hmm. seems like God's timing is perfect, I, would you like to go to Rwanda next week? Uh, wow. Sometimes don't you wish God's timing was gave a little more warning? Like, <laughs> just... It's a lot more fun this way. That's true, that's true, it's an adventure. 
Thank you so much, Sherry, for being here today and for sharing your story. I appreciate that you don't share it often and that you chose to come on a podcast and share it with me and Corey, but also yes, thank you. thousands and probably like a hundred other listeners. Awesome. But uh, I think Glad. that's really, really awesome. And I appreciate your perspective on God being enough, God being good at the end of the day. And thank you for sharing your journey. Yes. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. I think that was a really, really great episode with Sherry. Great in the sense that it brought up some challenging questions, but I think very applicable. Like we said, just most of us haven't witnessed a genocide, but a lot of us have suffered in some degree or another. And I I loved how Sherry validated that and also told us how she came to the conclusion that God is good. Yeah, I really appreciated her sharing, obviously, her story. uh, And as intense as it is, but also, yeah, the fact that we all can experience suffering Mm -hmm. and like your feelings are valid. Mm -hmm. Like just because you haven't experienced something as tragic as genocide, it doesn't mean that your feelings are invalid. They do matter. Mm -hmm. And I loved her challenge of encouraging us to search out, is God good? Right? Like, so whatever, whatever suffering you're experiencing, can you search for God? And what are your conclusions? Is God good? And that encouragement for all of us to really, to seek that out and find our own answer. Yeah. I loved that as well. I think that I know in my own life, when I've done that, that's been life-changing for me. And that's what she said as well for her. So I really appreciated that. Yeah. I think it was just a really powerful episode and a unique opportunity to talk to somebody who's experienced something that I will never experience, I hope. So I was I was thankful for her doing that. And I just was really impacted by the story, of the, of the boy that sent the letter and he'd already passed. Like that's, yeah. I don't know, that just stuck with me. That's hard. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you mm-hmm. again. We just, yeah, appreciate it. And uh, thank you for listening if you've made it this far. <laughs> so yeah, yeah if you uh, want to get in touch with us, uh, you can email us podcast at facalgary.com of any of our episodes we'd love to connect with you and special thank you uh, to ryan our producer uh, who has his work cut out for him literally cut out for him Uh, so we just uh, thank you for all that he does yeah thanks ryan thanks ryan and thank you everyone for joining us on the can we ask you this podcast we'll see you next time